Hey, we're here to celebrate Good Friday and all it means to us who follow Jesus. This is a day of celebration. I mean, Jesus' death on the cross, it tore the curtain temple in two, which provides direct access to God for each of us. Now on Sunday, it's gonna be Easter. The stone's gonna be rolled away. We're gonna have victory over death, hell, and the grave. But today's Friday, it comes Saturday. So what happened on Good Friday? What happened on Saturday that brought us to the final victory we're gonna have on Sunday? Now these events that took place, they cost a man his life and it wasn't instant. There was suffering, there was pain, there was humiliation, all planned, all taken for you and for me. Now, for us to own our faith, it means we really need to understand what Good Friday means and appreciate what Jesus really did for each of us. Because if we can tell others what happened, and we can grasp the gravity of the love He has for us, guys, we will truly never be the same. Now i got to warn you, this is going to be a little graphic. It's like the movies we've all seen, but this isn't a movie. These are the details of what our King did for us because He loves us that much. First thing I want to talk about is a thing called the whipping post. Okay, Jesus has been arrested. He's standing before Pilate and the people have a choice. Do we release Jesus or a criminal named Barabbas? The people, they choose Barabbas. So Friday morning, can you imagine it's early? Jesus, he's battered, he's bruised, he's dehydrated. I mean, he's exhausted from a sleepless night. He was taken across Jerusalem to the Praetorium of the fortress Antonia. Now Matthew 27, 26, it tells us what happens next. Then he, being Pilate, released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged, handing him over to be crucified. Preparations for the scourging are carried out. The prisoner is stripped of his clothing. Hands are tied to a post. The Roman legionnaire, he steps forward with a whip. It's called a flagrum. He has it in his hand. This short whip consists of several heavy leather throngs with two small balls of lead attached to the ends of each. Man, this heavy whip is brought down with full force again and again across Jesus' shoulders and back and legs. Can you imagine? At first, those heavy throngs cut through the skin only. And then as the blows continue, they cut deeper into the body's tissues. They first produce an oozing of blood from the capillaries and the veins of the skin. Finally, spurting arterial bleeding, it comes from the vessels and the underlying muscles. And then these small balls of lead, they first produce large, deep bruises that are broken only by subsequent blows. Finally, the skin on Jesus' back is, is just hanging and long ribbons, and the entire area of unrecognizable mass of torn bleeding tissue. When it's determined by the centurion in charge that the prisoner is really near death, can't hardly make it anymore, then and only then is the beating stopped. So this half fainting Jesus, can you imagine it? Guys, he's untied, he's allowed to slump to the stone pavement, wet in his own blood. These Roman soldiers, they think Jesus, being a king, is some kind of a joke. So they throw this robe across his bloody shoulders. They place a stick in his hand for a scepter. And then finally, a small bundle of flexible branches covered with long thorns are pressed deep into his scalp. The first known practice of crucifixion was by the Persians. Alexander brought it to Egypt and then to Carthage. Now the Romans learned it from Carthage and became very skilled at it. And a lot of paintings and films that you'll see will actually show Christ carrying the entire cross. But the practice the Romans used actually had only the upright post and the other post was permanently in the ground. Now the condemned man was forced to carry the horizontal piece which would have weighed about 110 pounds. He would have carried it from the prison to the place of execution. And you can imagine this heavy cross tied to his shoulders and the two thieves and the execution detail of the Roman soldiers begin their slow journey along the Via Della Rosa, which is a street that Jesus is said to have walked on on his way to his crucifixion. Now in Latin, Via Della Rosa means the way of suffering. 
And you can imagine as he's moving along this road, the cross is rough and it's heavy. The centurion in charge gets impatient. So he tells a North African onlooker named Simon of Serene to carry the cross. The journey from the fortress Antonia to Golgotha is 650 yards uphill. The horizontal crossbar, when they arrive, is thrown on the ground and Jesus is laid on it, on his back to the wood. Again, many painters also show the nails through Jesus' hands, but the nails were actually driven between the small bones and the wrists. If the nails were driven through the palms, they would strip out between the fingers when made to support the human body. Now this misconception may have come about when Jesus tells Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Anatomists, both modern and ancient, have always considered the wrist to be part of the hand. Now at this point, the legionnaire feels for the depression at the front of the wrist. He would drive a heavy square wrought iron nail through the wrist deep into the wood, and then he does the other wrist, careful not to pull the arms too tight. Jesus and the crossbar are lifted onto the upright post. The sign entitled Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, is nailed in place. The left foot is now pressed backward against the right foot. And with both feet extended, toes down, a nail is driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees moderately flexed. The victim is now crucified. As he slowly sags down, more weight on the nails and the wrist, excruciating pain shoots all along the fingers and into the arms, exploding in the brain. The nails in the wrist are putting pressure on the median nerves, and as he pushes himself upward to avoid this stretching torment, he places full weight on the nail in his foot. Again, the searing agony of the nail tearing through the nerves between the metatarsal bones of the feet. Now the arms are fatigued and waves of cramps sweep over the muscles. They're nodding, the relentless throbbing pain. Pectoral muscles are paralyzed. The intercoastal muscles are unable to act and air can be drawn into the lungs, but it can't be exhaled. Carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the bloodstream. And Jesus is barely able to say four things. First off, he says, forgive those involved in the crucifixion because they don't know what they're doing. And then he looks to the side at the thief and he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And then he looks down from the cross to his mother and John and he says, you now belong to each other. And then he says this, God, why have you forsaken me? Meaning I feel the weight of everyone's sin on me and I am for this moment separated from you because you are holy and I am bearing this sin. It's almost over at this point. The loss of tissue fluids has reached a critical level and the compressed heart is struggling to pump the heavy, thick, sluggish blood into the tissue. The lungs are frantic, gasping for small gulps of air. And Jesus says, I'm thirsty. And they try to give him a sponge soaked in sour wine for pain. And then he says, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. In Matthew 27, 51, it says, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. Jesus has conquered sin. He's made a way for us to have a relationship between an unholy people and a holy God. In Isaiah 53, God details the death of Jesus almost 700 years before it takes place. Now in verse nine, it says, he was assigned a grave with the wicked, meaning after Jesus dies, the Roman soldiers were gonna put him in a grave where other criminals were buried. Instead, the verse goes on to say, he was assigned a grave with the rich. The rich was Joseph of Arimathea. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth and placed it in his own tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Now in John's account, it says another man named Nicodemus accompanied Joseph. They put together a 75 pound mixture of myrrh and aloe. Then after dipping the cloth in the mixture, they wrapped it around Jesus' body. 
Now, Jewish people didn't embalm. Instead, they put perfume on bodies to honor and cover the smell of decay. Joseph and Nicodemus were part of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders. Joseph works up the courage, regardless of what the Jewish council thought of him, to ask for Jesus' body. He then carried him to a tomb he had for himself. Now remember, a tomb in the time of Jesus would have been a natural cave, or in this case, a man-made cave out of rock. They roll a large stone in front of the tomb so animals, birds, and, and thieves can't get in. The chief priests are really concerned. Man, they don't think that the stone's gonna be enough. They fear Jesus' disciples will roll the stone away and take his body out and claim that he has risen like he said he would. So they convinced Pilate to put a seal on the tomb saying it was under Roman protection and a guard to ensure that no one could take the body. Jesus is now in the tomb. We know he rises on the third day, Easter Sunday. But have you ever wondered what happened between Friday and Sunday? You know, here's the reason we're doing this tonight. This is the reason we're teaching this. I really want this church to own their faith. I want you to know the truth about what happened to Jesus. I want you to know how we believe. So when somebody challenges our faith, we go, wait a minute, I don't see that in the Bible. And we take them to the scripture and we own our faith, right? It's so not only do I want us to own our faith at this church, I want us to really, when we understand the truth, really receive uh, the magnitude, the gravity, uh, the gratefulness we have for all that Jesus did throughout this week and this weekend as we celebrate Easter. So we know on Friday we saw the whipping post. We learned about that. We saw the cross and the crucifixion. He's in the tomb. What happens? He dies about 3 o'clock on uh, Friday afternoon, and they have to be in the tomb. He has to be in the tomb by 6 o'clock because the Sabbath starts at 6, and you can't work after 6 o'clock. So they hurry up and get him in the tomb about 6 o'clock on Friday night. And then the ladies come on Saturday morning, or Sunday morning, excuse me, on Easter day, and, and they're looking to see if Jesus is there, and that, that stone is rolled away from that tomb, and he is risen. But what did he do between Friday night and Sunday? I think he did something. I think we're going to read about it. It's in 1 Peter. It's in uh, chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. I'm going to read you three simple verses as we close up tonight. And then I'm going to go back and break those up for you. So here we go. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. All right, I'm going to read verse 18 and break that down for you, and then I'm going to go back and read verse 19 and 20, and we're going to teach through that. So here's verse 18. It says this. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Let me stop there for a minute. So Christ is Jesus, right? And he suffered one time for sins, the righteous. He's the righteous for us, the people, the unrighteous. He's the just, we're the unjust. He's the worthy, we're the unworthy. He's the holy, we're the unholy. He is the sinless, we're the sinful. So he's the righteous, we're the unrighteous, and he didn't have sin, but he suffered at one time. He allowed the sin of the world, your sin and my sin, before we were even born, to be laid upon him. He was separated from God. And why did he do this? It said this, to bring you to God. So he takes the sin of the world upon himself. The righteous person didn't have to do that, but he did it so you and I could have direct access with God. That curtain was torn in two on Friday afternoon, and that's the true victory. He just shows it on Sunday morning. We really had victory when that curtain was torn in two. We have direct access with God. Here's the rest of verse 18. He says, he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. So Jesus is modeling what happens to you and I when we die. His body was put to death. So when he died on that cross, that body that you saw that was, was, was bruised and bloodied and scarred, he says, I don't need that body anymore. He was made alive in the spirit, his inner being, who he truly was. He was made alive in that spirit, just like you and I. What happens when we die? Thank goodness I don't have this ugly looking body anymore. Man, I can push it to the side. I'm like, I don't need that. My inner being comes to life. And all of a sudden, who I really am is there. And one day soon, I'll get a glorified body. We'll still know each other, says in the Bible, known and be known. 
But I'll have this perfect body with no decay, no rust anymore. Who ready for that? So in Thessalonians, it says when we are absent from the body, we die that first death because we have Jesus as the Lord of our life. We are in the presence of God. So that's what happened here is Jesus, his body dies, and now all of a sudden, who he is, his inner spirit comes alive. Verse 18 is pretty simple. Now I'm going to read verse 19 and 20, and we're going to get very close to what happened, I believe, between Friday night and Sunday morning. But scholars are disagreeing on who the imprisoned spirits were. So I'm going to narrow it down to a couple of uh, valid choices here. But let me read through this, verse 19 and 20. It says, after being made alive. So we're again, Jesus is now made alive in his spirit. What did he do? Did he just stick around in the tomb? No, it says he went. Oh, he went somewhere. What did he do? It says he made proclamation. What is that? He went somewhere and made proclamation. He proclaimed that I had now have completed the victory over death, hell, and the grave. He made proclamation. To who? To the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago. Well, how long ago? It says when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. Man, that's a long time ago while the ark was being built. So when you look at that, you can see that he went somewhere. Where did he go? We're going to talk about that. He made proclamations saying victory over death, hell, and the grave to the imprisoned spirits, those who were disobedient back in the days of Noah. Now, to get the understanding of what that is, you have to go back to Genesis 6 and 7, and you've got to read the account of Noah, the ark, and the flood. And basically what happened in the, basically in the first five chapters of the Bible, God is really going, this is not the way it was supposed to turn out. I mean, you have Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's supposed to be a perfect place, perfect relationship. But then they just chose to be sinful people, depend on themselves. They didn't need God, they said. And then you have Cain and Abel. You have the fall of man in the first five chapters of Genesis. It's really crazy how that happens. And then what happens in chapter 6, when you look at verse 3, it says that he said, I have got to start over, God's saying. I'm going to give them 120 years to get this thing right. So when it says he waited patiently, that's what he was doing, 120 years. Some people go, man, isn't God compassionate? Why would he wipe people out with a flood? He, he waited patiently. He waited 120 years for Noah to tell people about God. How do you know that? Well, it says back in the, in the chapter 6 and 7, he's looking for the righteous people, the obedient people, and he only found eight. He found Noah and his wife, three sons and three daughters. There's only eight people that were obedient that were righteous. That's all he could find. Waiting patiently, 120 years, he didn't want to do it. He's like, come on, get this right. You guys are making some bad choices. Don't you want me in your life? And so by, by, by knowing who is obedient and disobedient, we can see where he went. He went to a place called Hades. This is where Jesus went. Now, Listen, some people think that uh, there were people back in the Old Testament days that never heard about God. And when Jesus died, he went down to some place spatially we don't know and said, I'm going to proclaim the truth, and now you can come back with me to heaven. That is, that is wrong. That is not even correct at all. The reason why we need to know that is because he is looking for obedient people, and he has disobedient people. And he said, listen, don't you know that I'm God. Noah preached the word, and people said, no, I don't want to do that. You're foolish. You're building an ark. You're crazy and all that kind of stuff. So if we are Christ followers, right, we only die one earthly death, and when we do, we're absent from the body, present with Christ, go right to heaven and never die a second time. If we're disobedient, if we do not ask Jesus to be Lord of life on this earth, we don't, don't take a risk, guys. This is, that's bad teaching if somebody says, hey, don't worry about it. If you die, you can go to some place, and Jesus will come get you later. That's not going to happen. We have got to know Jesus on this earth, ask him to be the Lord of our life. And if we don't, the person that doesn't, their spirit is made alive, and they go, not to the grave and rest, it's not over. They actually live forever, unfortunately, in hell. So they go to a place called Hades. So if you're separated from God, you go to a place called Hades, which is basically, it's, a, it's part of hell. And they're waiting for revelation to come, for God to come back for the great white throne of judgment. And those people, will, unfortunately, have to stand before God, that great white throne of judgment in the end days. And God will be sad when he say, says this, but he's going to go, you, you chose to be separated from me on this earth, so sadly, you've got to continue your choice the rest of your life. And he puts them into a place called Gehenna, their final place where Satan's going to be, uh, the gnashing of the teeth and the weeping and the, the worst place ever. You don't want to be there. You want Jesus in your life. You can't, you can't take that risk. So by knowing that, we know that they were disobedient spirits. So in the, in the days of Noah, scholars will say, one set of scholars will say, those were the people. In the days of Noah, they said, I don't believe it. And then they got washed away in the flood, and they're the ones that are being held there. 
Now, there's another set of scholars that say, wait a minute, we think there's fallen angels that Jesus is talking to. Those are demons. Why do they think that? Well, when you go to 2 Peter 2, 4, it says this. It says God was, was basically so frustrated with the demons at that time that he imprisoned them and put them into hell. Now, there's no other place in the Bible that really explains why some demons uh, at that time are put into hell imprisonment and some now are allowed to be free and roam like they are today with Satan, still trying to separate us from God. There's no explanation for that in the Bible, so I'm not going to give you one of those. But there is a set of, of fallen angels, so we have Satan in heaven, and he says, I want to be number one, and God says, you can't be number one, you're number two, isn't that good enough? He goes, nope, I want to be number one. He goes, well, your pride is going to cast you out of heaven. So he went down to this earth, God says, be gone, and I cannot believe it, if you can believe it, that some of these uh, angels said, I'm going to be on Satan's team. I'm like, man, you're on the losing team, what a bad choice. And so God cast Satan and these demons down here to earth, and these demons are vile and they're bad, and it just made God so angry that he imprisoned some of them. And the scholars will say that's who Jesus went down to. He was preaching proclamation of death, hell, and the grave, the victory over that, to the demons going, you shouldn't have chosen. You made a bad choice. You should have stayed in heaven. What are you choosing Satan for? This is going to be your punishment. And or if it's the people, the other set of scholars say, then he's going, you should have listened to Noah. So that's what happened between Friday and Saturday. Now we know. So when someone asks you what good Friday means, it simply is Jesus paid the price on the cross. And when he said it's finished, I commit my spirit into your hands, God. The curtain was torn in two, direct access to God 24-7. That's the victory. And then that's the victory over death. The tomb was not there. He wasn't able to be in that tomb. He left. He went somewhere. He went to hell and proclaimed that victory over either, either fallen angels or people in Noah's time that didn't believe in him. And there's no eternal value in picking that. I'm not going to argue or debate that. But what we have eternal value in is what happened on Sunday, right? What happened on Sunday is he said, hey, I want to not just go proclaim it. I want to show it. Come and look. There's an empty tomb. I have risen. Is what he said. That's what we're talking about. Praise the Lord. So now you know, if someone asks you what happened, you can explain the entire weekend now, right? You can own your faith. And if they tell you something different, say, no, 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 I'm going to take you and show you. And not only can we own our faith now because we understand that teaching. Listen, guys, I'm serious. This day, just like you were clapping a minute ago, what, what he did paid it all. The magnitude of that love, it should just grab our heart. It should fill our spirit. In fact, that's how I want to close. Would you stand to your feet? Let's close, let's close this way. I believe we're here for one reason. I believe God put us here on earth to be in relationship with him that brings him the most glory. I believe we're supposed to be a glory-filled, spirit-filled people. And what we're going to do is we're going to give God the best glory, honor, and praise for what he did for Good Friday for this weekend. And as I do that, I want to just fill you up a minute and just give you a, a picture of what we're thankful for. We're thankful for all the physical things he did. We're thankful for the whipping post. We're thankful that he was able to, to, to go on the cross and be crucified, that he was actually dead. They put him in the tomb, and then he was made alive. All the humiliation, all the pain, all the dehydration, all the things he did for us, the just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous, the holy for the unholy, the worthy for the unworthy, the sinless for the sinful people. And because of that, he simply opened his hands up and said, I love you this much on the cross. And the nails didn't hold him to the cross, but the love that he has for you and me held him to the cross. And what happened is Jesus says, now you will never walk alone on this earth. You are under my umbrella of grace, mercy, provision. You will make it to heaven. My plan is that your name's be written in the Lamb's book of life. You will never have crying, suffering, pain ever again. I love you. Let's give God glory. God, we love you and we thank you and we praise you and you're worthy and you're due of our praise and our glory and our honor. God, we exalt you.